Uh, good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Education, Children and Young People Committee in 2022. We have received apologies from the convener, Sue Weber, MSP, and from Willie Rennie, MSP. I would like to welcome Pam Gosel, MSP, who is joining the committee today for the public part of the meeting. The first item on our agenda today is a decision on taking business in private. Can I ask whether members are content to take agenda item seven in private? Are we all agreed? I see that we are. Thank you. Our next items of business are evidence sessions with Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Higher Education and Further Education, Youth Employment and Training, and his officials who are all joining us virtually today. The first session will inform our college regionalisation inquiry and the second will allow the committee to follow up on issues raised at an earlier meeting on universities. I would like to welcome the Minister and the Scottish Government officials. Stephen Patherana, Director, Advanced Learning and Science. Helen Webster, Deputy Director for Reform, Directorate for Advanced Learning and Science. And Jess Dolan, Head of Colleges and Economic Impact. We have a lot of ground to cover this morning, so I would like to invite the Minister to make a short opening statement before we move on to questions. Minister, you have up to five minutes. Thank you, Convener. Before I address the, the subject of the matter today, can I thank you and the committee for enabling me to participate remotely? I hope it was a short order. Uh, the request, and I very much uh, appreciate it. I promise to try and not make a habit of bursting at uh, my ankle, and next time hope to be with you uh, in uh, person. Uh, convener, it has been over a, a decade since the Scottish Government announced changes to the college landscape as part of wider reforms introduced by the post-16 Education Scotland Act, leading to college regionalisation, the, the subject that we are about to discuss, which I am very happy to be here to talk about with you. Uh, our colleges are vital not just in the delivery of education, but in addressing some of the greatest challenges facing Scotland today. Colleges deliver the skilled workforce for much of Scotland's foundational economy, with college graduates becoming electric car mechanics, business owners in the travel and tourism sector, pursuing careers in digital infrastructure, or providing care to people in our hospitals and care homes. These are, to name only a few examples of the excellence in Scotland's college sector excellence, I have been privileged to witness firsthand in my many visits to our colleges and experience, I am sure, that is shared by you, convener, and other committee members when undertaking their own visits to their own local colleges. Scotland's colleges give those facing the greatest barriers to learning the opportunity to fulfil their potential. In 2021, uh, over a fifth, 22.6 per cent of learning hours were delivered to students with a declared disability, 6.4 per cent of learning hours to those with care experience, and 16.3 per cent of learning hours to those in the 10 per cent most economically deprived areas. Regionalisation has brought a number of benefits. Colleges are anchored institutions in their local economies and communities, uh, delivering through regional partnerships with universities, with schools, with local authorities, and with businesses in their area. As you have heard directly from the college principals you have spoken with, this has led to universities and colleges creating clearer progression routes to higher levels of study, from traditional articulation models to integrated learner journeys. I recognise, the, of course, the significant impacts of the pandemic. There was very clear adaptability and resilience on the part of students and staff in our college sector in pivoting to digital delivery and the challenge of impacts on mental health and wellbeing. It means the government will continue to address the legacy of COVID-19 and take on board the lessons as we plan for the future. As we continue to move forward from the pandemic, collaborative working to deliver shared outcomes remains essential. Regionalisation has improved the resilience of the college sector, delivering efficiencies and benefits of scale, putting colleges on a better footing to work with more difficult financial realities that are being felt across the public sector. 
Uh, we face significant funding pressures, and we are thinking carefully and creatively to ensure we continue to deliver for Scotland's learners. I assure colleges that we will continue to engage with them throughout the budget process. Despite the challenges we face, and I don't pretend convener that there aren't any, we are building on strong foundations. The committee in previous sessions discussed the development of the purpose and principles for post school education, skills development, and research. Now, this work is about setting the direction for the longer term, aligning and galvanising all actors and supporting reform and continuous improvements to deliver lasting change for future generations, ensuring that we continue to meet the changing demands of Scotland's learners and our future economy. And I also look forward to the conclusions of your inquiry convener to help inform our considerations as we move forward uh, too. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Along with my officials, I look forward to answering any questions you committee may have for me. Um, thank you, Minister, for that. Um, I'm going to uh, start off as we move into questions. Um, I would expect that uh, most, if not all, the questions will be directed to the Minister. However, should anyone else wish to come in on any of the questions, please put a capital R in the chat box. The clerks will be monitoring the chat box, and I will bring you in when I can. Uh, so, Minister, uh, thank you very much for that opening statement. Um, I'd like to sort of start off with the purpose of uh, regionalisation, which was, uh, you know, to remove duplication and unnecessary competition between universities, colleges, uh, to enable reforms, to meet the current employment challenges and uh, skills challenges, um, and provide a rapid response to that, uh, and to create more efficiencies. Uh, to what extent do you think that the those aims of regionalisation have been achieved over the last 10 years? Uh, I, I think to a greater large extent, convener, they have been. I think we have seen uh, a reduction in the duplication in uh, course uh, provision. We, of course, that delivers the efficiencies and benefits of its scale, uh, which uh, in turn positively impact on uh, frontline delivery. For students, I believe that uh, since regionalisations, we've seen uh, greater agility, flexibility, and responsiveness in uh, the college sector to the needs of their learners, to the wider communities in which uh, they serve, to employers in the areas uh, they serve. Uh, as I say, uh, we have not only seen a reduction in the uh, duplication of course provision, but we've also seen that done on a basis that maintains a course provision across uh, geographical uh, areas. I also think, and I think this is a, an uh, enormously important uh, part of the equation, it can be that we have uh, greater clarity uh, in terms of learner pathways, we have better, better uh, collaboration and joined up uh, activity uh, between uh, our academic institutions, between uh, colleges and universities, for example, uh, we also see greater levels of uh, provision of senior phase school learning in the college environment as well. I think those are positive uh, developments, and I think they were reflected in some of the evidence you heard from the principals that you spoke with in terms of some of the, the pathways that were created that they themselves articulated that probably weren't possible uh, year, in years gone by. Thank you for that. Um, we also know at the moment that we do have uh, pressures on um, skills um, and making sure that we can respond to the new skills that are required. Um, and we, we took that in evidence as well. Um, so do you think that uh, go, looking forward in the future, uh, do you think things are all right just now or um, there are improvements that could be made in order to, to uh, make sure that colleges can respond more rapidly to filling the uh, skills gaps that we have? Well, undoubtedly, improvements can be made. I don't think uh, any of us would pretend uh, that um, there isn't still a journey to go in terms of making sure that our institutions can be ever more uh, responsive to the requirements of our society, to uh, requirements and needs of uh, our economy. I suppose the fundamental question, though, is whether or not regionalisation creates a better platform for that to be enabled. And for all the, the reasons I've uh, laid out, I believe that uh, to be the case. And if I look uh, across the, the country in terms of the, uh, the many visits that I've undertaken 
to Scotland's colleges. I've seen that uh, in action of, I think, back to, for example, uh, my visit to West Lothian College, where they had a good tie-up with the Scottish Ambulance Service to support people to transition from various sectors of the economy into the social uh, care sector, uh, for uh, example, of, I think, to my visit to uh, Borders College, using their STEM uh, centre to better support the upskilling of uh, employers, uh, uh, electricians uh, in that area, to be able to uh, undertake really important types of activity for the future responders to the Green Skills Agenda through the installation of ground source heat pumps, for example. That is the type of activity that is taking place, and I believe the, what we have done through uh, regionalisation has enabled that uh, to happen. But uh, undoubtedly, uh, there is still more uh, to be done, and I am up for that challenge, and all Scotland's colleges are too. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that. Um, I am finished for the time being. Um, I may come in later, but I would like to bring in my colleague, uh, Graham Day. Yeah, thank you, Kabir, and, and morning, Minister. Um, you mentioned the word challenge there. Um, how big a challenge would you accept has been uh, posed Scotland's colleges uh, by a flat cash settlement uh, for the coming years? Well, I, I wouldn't uh, suppose to pretend that there aren't challenges in terms of trying to manage that budget process, and that's something we're going to have to to work very closely with college principals, with the wider workforce, try and uh, work our way through. And in my opening statement, I've already uh, made the point, and it's a sincere and genuine commitment. I'll work collaboratively with uh, Scotland's colleges to respond to that challenge. I must observe, uh, of course, that some of these challenges are ones that we have to grapple with right across the entirety of Scotland's budget. If you look at the budget position, uh, today, by comparison, when we published uh, the budget in December 2021, 20, we estimate that it is worth some £1.7 billion less. So that is no small uh, challenge. But what we are committed to doing is making sure that we can, uh, as much as possible, make sure that we are investing in, in the front line uh, for Scotland's college sector. And that is what I am committed to, to working with them to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of that is uh, entirely accurate. Um, but looking for solutions to this, um, colleges um, are obviously restricted in their ability to generate additional income, um, no ability to borrow or to, to hold reserves. Are these areas that you would be prepared to look at? And I think that takes us into the territory of ONS uh, reclassification. So uh, the first thing I would observe is that, to a greater or lesser degree, that's out with our hands. We can't direct the Office for National Statistics to determine how they will classify any entity. We didn't ask them to reclassify Scotland's colleges. That was a decision they took. Now, to be fair, there is a legitimate question as to whether or not we could adjust the setup of Scotland's colleges, incorporated colleges. Of course, not every college is incorporated, but the vast majority of them are. Uh, we could look at that to uh, reconsider that proposition, although, again, there would be absolutely no guarantee that the ONS would not still say, well, actually, uh, under the terms of their classification, they'd be classified as uh, public bodies. Uh, my view is, on balance, that uh, notwithstanding uh, some of the, the challenges that we have, I think it is appropriate and correct that we continue to operate with the environment that we have in terms of how incorporated colleges are structured, something that has been in place for a long time. It largely emanates from a piece of legislation in 1993, so it predates devolution, let alone this administration. I think, on balance, that is the correct formula in terms of the relationship we have with them being largely publicly funded. What I have committed to doing, and this was in response to the SFC a review on sustainability is to look at if there are, can be further uh, flexibilities to try and uh, help colleges uh, better enable some of these challenges. That is something that we are committed to doing. That is something we are looking at with SFC, and it is something that I have committed to College of Scotland, uh, College of Scotland to, to looking at on an expedited basis, because I know they are looking for these things uh, in fairly short order. So, so going to put you on the spot there. I mean, you are talking about dealing with this on an expedited basis. 
how quickly do you think you would get to the po point where you had identified whether there were flexibilities available to you uh, to offer colleges and whether you'd be prepared to, to make that offer? So there are some flexibilities already being extended, uh, of course, in terms of um, some latitude uh, for colleges in uh, meeting the credit targets without uh, clawback it being uh, implemented by the Scottish Funding Council. So right now, in the environment we have, we can operate some latitude, we can operate some flexibility. The question isn't it's a, a reasonable question, it's one that's been posed of us, is can we go uh, further? I, I'm committed to, to looking at that. It might be possible that there's something we can do in this current financial year, but certainly looking ahead to the next financial year, I think it's something that we, sorry, I should say academic year, uh, of course, uh, Mr Day. Uh, this academic year, we will look at it, but certainly by next academic year, uh, I believe there might be more we can do. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you, um, Graeme Day. Um, if, if it's all right, um, I'd like to stick with Graeme because Graeme wanted to explore a wee bit further on the ONS classification um, and possibly um, Ruth would come in on that. I'm content with the answers. Of, of You're content with the answers on that. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, Mr Kerr. Minister, what are the other flexibilities? What are the current set of flexibilities that have already been offered to the colleges? And what has he worked up with his officials in terms of a menu of possible further flexibilities? Could you be quite specific about that? Uh, because, frankly, it would be good to get that out in the public realm. So one of the things that there's been a request, uh, Mr Kerr, from Scotland's colleges, is whether or not we need to have... Uh, such a level of credit-based uh, provision by comparison to some uh, increased latitude uh, in enabling colleges to be uh, more responsive to uh, things that uh, emerge in terms of employer uh, demand locally. So that's something I'm committed to, to looking at. Now, can I earnestly and honestly say that we've landed in terms of where we may end up on that uh, point? No, I, I can't. But we also have a, a good uh, foundation in terms of learning how that could uh, look like. So if you look at the Flex Workforce Development Fund, for uh, example, uh, that's uh, been done in such a way that it enables employers to have a more direct relationship to draw down funding to be uh, quite responsive to their uh, specific requirements. If you look at the National Transition Training Fund that we put in place, that enabled colleges to respond very flexibly. So if you, you go back to the at the point I made in response to the convener's opening questions, I talked about the West Lothian College example in terms of the work they did with the Scottish Ambulance Service, and that was drawn down through National Transition Training Fund resource. So there is a basis in which we can be informed by the decisions we might take. I suppose the point I would make is it's something that we are actively engaged with Scotland's uh, colleges, Colleges Scotland, to uh, discuss further and to see if we can land somewhere that might enable them to, to exercise uh, some more latitude in terms of the public resource we provide them. So, so I can hear that would be uh, demand-led apprenticeships? Is that what... You, I mean, I'm trying to work through what you just said, because I didn't really quite grasp it. I mean, are you saying that there would be more demand-led apprenticeships so that local businesses could, could, as it were, have cash following their apprentices into the college system? I mean, Hugh Hall, the principal of Fife College, was very specific about this in his evidence to us. He said that there were constraints and bureaucracy, for example, that were obviously costly and time-consuming and resource-consuming. Could there be a reduction in the constraints and bureaucracy that Hugh Hall refers to? Could there be, could there be some latitude in terms of borrowing? Um, uh, could colleges borrow in order to support their um, expansion, to fulfil local demands, such as you've just described? What's your response to those questions and comments? Well, there's also a few things uh, there, Mr Kerr, in terms of uh, borrowing. Uh, that's something we'll actively look at and consider. Uh, there are some uh, constraints around ONS classification uh, there, but if there's something we can do, then uh, certainly we'll consider it. In terms of issues around uh, bureaucracy, 
that can often be a loaded term. I think you would agree, Mr Kerr, it's appropriate that we make sure public resources are accounted for, but I certainly don't want anything to be overly burdensome on a basis that isn't required. So, again, if there are specific propositions around how we can fulfil our requirements, our fundamental requirements, to account for the public purse, but on a basis that um, uh, might not be felt to be as burdensome for uh, Scotland's colleges, then, of course, I'm willing to consider that. That would require a specific proposition, uh, of course. In terms of your first question, I wasn't thinking specifically in relation to apprenticeships uh, necessarily. We have, uh, by my uh, estimation, by my uh, view, well-established and pretty successful model for delivering apprenticeships, which uh, derives from uh, the uh, relationship that Skills Development Scotland has with the providers it contracts uh, with, of which Scotland's colleges are, uh, of course, involved. Uh, but I was thinking more in relation to things such as uh, how can colleges respond to the requirements of the existing workforce? Clearly, any apprentice who is recruited is ordinarily um, uh, a new entrant to the workforce, or at the very least, someone who might have been in the workforce who it might be uh, the initial experience of work-based uh, learning. What we now need uh, in terms of being responsive to the the various uh, social and economic imperatives ahead of us in terms of demographic change, in terms of need to respond to the climate emergency, we need to make sure that we're upskilling existing uh, members of the workforce so they don't fall out of the labour market with all the consequential uh, challenges that might entail. So, how can we make sure that colleges are ever more responsive to that requirement? Uh, it's kind of that territory I I'm thinking of. I also know, for example, I had a Mr. Doris will doubtless have. Uh, questions for me as well, but I took a very good visit with him to Glasgow Kelvin the College. Uh, I know Ms Callahan's had, had an interest in this uh, as well in terms of community learning and uh, development. So, can we facilitate more of that type of uh, activity as well? So, these are all things that we're considering right now. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, and uh, we will now move on to, in fact, uh, Bob Doris. Always, if we planned it, could we? Um, <laughs> thank you. If you're a student at Glasgow Kelvin College or any other college eh, minister and you're doing a uh, social science eh, HNC eh, qualification for at level seven, put my teeth in there, convener, or you do that as the equivalent of a undergraduate first year social science course at university, why do you get more funding for that student going to university than you get for that student going to college? Well, first of all, I think we should say, convener, Mr. Dawson, I did not uh, plan uh, that in terms of me uh, teeing him up for uh, a question that was a mere matter of uh, coincidence. Uh, the arrangements that uh, you refer to, Mr. Doris, are uh, fairly long-standing and reflect that provision in different environments doesn't necessarily look uh, precisely the same. So, some of the overheads that you'll see. In Scotland's universities, it might not be reflected in the same way as you see in some of Scotland's colleges. You might, for example, see a greater range of uh, lecturers and tutors involved in the experience of a university student by comparison to a, a college student. We see some of the, the same interaction in terms of funding per head for school pupils uh, as well. So, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, that question, it is driven by a, a lot of uh, these factors. Now, there is a, a legitimate question to say whether or not we have got the balance right. These are things that we will always be willing to consider, but uh, in terms of uh, the background, that is effective to what drives that. A helpful answer, Minister. I know I have raised this with you in the Chamber before as well. So I was following through a, a line of questioning more, more generally. Could we deliberately pick social science because the, there is no lab overheads there? or significant infrastructure overheads. It's young people interacting with the, the, the lecturer or, or tutor. So I don't see what the, the, the additional cost for universities would be unless one is so, a social science degrees to cross subsidise other activities at university. I, I understand that the average uh, student uh, reimbursement rate for colleges is five thousand and fifty four pounds. It's seven thousand five hundred and fifty eight pounds for universities. That is 
quite striking. When I raised this in Parliament with you, Minister, you, uh, you said that these matters were being discussed in uh, an ongoing dialogue. Not just that, I should point out, with the Scottish Funding Council, College of Scotland, the University of Scotland. Is there any more details you can give me on how those discussions are going? No, I mean, there's nothing specific I can say beyond clearly there are, uh, these are matters that will always remain under consideration. I should go back to the point I've made already, of course, that, uh, and I think this point has been made in evidence uh, to you by College of Scotland, they weren't looking for universities to get uh, less uh, necessarily. So, for us to, to do this on uh, that basis, that would require additional resource. And um, I would go back to the point I've already made around where we are in terms of the, the budgetary position right now, which is that the Scottish Government budget today is worth around £1.7 billion pounds less in, in real terms than it was when we published it in December 2021. That said, it is incumbent on us to always consider these things, and we will continue to make it under review, keep it under review. Convener, I, I abs absolutely accept that. Um, but when I raised it in Parliament, I, d I did... I, I you could make that brief, because I do have other members that right. want to okay. come in. Just Thank you. Finishing off this line of questioning, which I think is important, Convener, uh, I did caveat when I asked this in the Chamber about we can't just magic money to address that funding gap, but the direction of travel, and there is an aspiration, and there is a policy where you can start to kind of see that divergence uh, end and, and work towards it. So given the fact that 43% of young people from the most deprived areas in universities and undergraduate course started their career at colleges, we can see the fantastic work that colleges do that I would not want to put at risk. So as a direction of travel, as and when resources arrive, uh, Minister, do you think it would be desirable to start to close that gap? I think we need to be led by the evidence. I will go back to the point I have made already. It would need to be on the basis of what the comparative overhead requirements are. Uh, and uh, and I, mean, you know, I take the point Mr Doris has picked a, a very specific uh, course matter. Uh, we have not, with a few exceptions in terms of what we call a protected subject matter, which is uh, primarily uh, the uh, medical courses that are delivered to uh, universities. We do not tend to put in any distinction between what the type of specific courses uh, might be, uh, not least because we largely rely on our institutions to determine what that uh, provision uh, might be, and we would not want to create any sort of perverse uh, incentives in terms of offering differential uh, contribution rates depending on uh, subject matter. But notwithstanding uh, at that point, I understand the point that Mr. Doris is making uh, around the uh, the comparative overheads not necessarily being that different between some courses. But uh, in terms of the overall position, uh, we'd need to be evidence-led. You know, what would uh, the necessity be beyond me understanding on a general basis that the sector is under financial pressure and would uh, be desirous for them to have more resource, but what the rationale would be for doing it on the basis of looking at it in terms of cost per head. Can I just bring in um, Stephen Pathirana on line? And Stephen will be followed by uh, Pam Gosal, who would like to come in on a supplementary. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to what Mr. Minister was sharing with you there, and specifically uh, in response to the question around the social science degree example. And, and that's fundamentally that while the overall funding levels for universities are higher on average than colleges for the reasons the Minister explained, there is differentiation within that in terms of the way F SFC funds different types of courses in universities. So social sciences and arts courses, broadly speaking, are funded at lower rates, which are probably more comparable to the rates in colleges anyway. So there is it, 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 there is a lot of nuance and complexity in the system the SFC deals with, and it isn't just looking at the average figures uh, hides a lot of that. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, I've had a request from the committee that if we could get the data on that, that would be extremely helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, Pam Gosal. 
Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister, and the officials as well. My question is on the back of Bob Doris's question in relation to closing the gap. Not only do we see that there is a gap between colleges getting less and universities getting more per student, but also if you go on to uh, schools, the Improvement Service benchmarking framework shows that the average gross spend per pupil in Scotland in 2020 to 2021 was 9,273 per child per, for preschool education, and then for primary school it was 5,916, and then per school when uh, per pupil at secondary it was higher, up to 7,657. Uh, uh, pounds, and I just want to ask the minister that why is it such comparisons between uh, you know from the, the colleges are so lower compared to the universities, and then compared to the schools, are they worth any less? Are, are pupils at school are more, and university are more, and colleges are less? Well, I, I've tried to answer that already, Ms. Gosal. So uh, to. A great to a large extent that's driven by the experience of learning and teaching. So uh, a school pupil will come into contact with many more teachers than a college student might with as to lecturers or instructors. That inevitably leads to a, a higher uh, unit cost per head, if that's the way it, you want to, to, to look at it. So in some senses, we're not really comparing like for like because the experience of education between each phase of a person's journey through education is different. There are different drivers in terms of the costs involved. So that's that's largely what drives the differential. To express that in terms of then whether or not that means we value one part of the system less by comparison to the other. No, frankly, it doesn't. It's just a a reflection of the reality of the overheads involved, by and large. So, what I have, of course, said in response to Mr. Doris is we can always look and keep these things under review. That's something we will look to do. But again, uh, and you might hear me say this quite a lot today, Ms. Gosal, because it's frankly the reality that we're grappling with is that the budget, as we have now, by comparison to what we published in December 20. At 21 is worth 1.7 billion pounds less. So, I'm all for people making positive suggestions as to um, a redistribution of uh, resource. That's fine, uh, but if people are going to make that suggestion, then they better be prepared to come to me and say how we're going to do that. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, I believe that Michael Mara wanted to ask a supplementary on this section. Yeah, yeah. Th th thanks, Convener. Uh, I suppose I would ask the Minister to reflect on what we are hearing from the sector more directly. I mean, he makes the argument that this is really about overheads. You know, it is more expensive to educate a, a student at, the, at a university than it is at a college. I mean, does he recognise the feeling in the college sector that they are very, very much treated as the poor relations in, this, uh, in your portfolio? Uh, not just in, the, uh, in comparison to universities, but in comparison to schools also. And that's not just in the uh, rate of uh, money per pupil. It's also, for instance, in the capital budget um, and the um, complete absence. I mean, I, I have principals telling me they're ashamed of the condition of their buildings because there's no money to invest in this. So, I mean, I, I think we can look at these numbers, but you, could you understand that that is how the leaders and the teachers in colleges feel? Well, I recognise it's been said. I've heard that said to me directly. It's certainly not my opinion. It's not my view that colleges are second rate or second class by comparison to any other element of our education system. I believe that we have a continuum of educational provision, and each element is as important as the other through. Uh, the early years through the school experience, through community learning and development, which I'll be candid, and I'm sure you've heard as well, Mr. Mara, who will also say that some of uh, these things through colleges, through uh, to uh, universities. So it's certainly not my uh, uh, perception. Obviously, um, gone over in some detail. But, uh, Minister, Minister to... if I can, I mean, you're, th those, you're, you're, what you're telling us is your understanding isn't being reflected in your decisions. You're saying that you have no. that sympathy, but actually you're the person in charge. 
you're making these decisions, you're setting priorities, I mean, you have to be able to defend that differential, don't you? Well, yes, and I've, I've, I've laid that out. There is a reason for the differential. I've set that out. I've answered that uh, in, in more than one occasion uh, now. In terms of the point you were making about uh, capital uh, investment, these are uh, issues I also I understand. One of the challenges we have right now is that we have a college state that in many parts of the country is maturing, is maturing at the, uh, the same age. So that brings pressures to bear. In terms of what uh, we are doing going forward, is I have, and I know this was it's something that the committee explored with Karen Watt when she was giving evidence, is we've asked the SFC uh, to bring forward uh, an estate strategy. Uh, that's something I uh, am looking forward to uh, receiving, because that will then inform uh, how we respond to some of the, the challenges. I do recognise, I do understand, exist out there, and we will. Uh, seek to be uh, response to that. Mr. Mar will be aware that there has been a significant uplift in terms of the capital we have allocated to Scotland's uh, colleges this year, for the very precise reason that we recognise we need to uh, renew our uh, uh, college estate. Thank you, Minister. We're actually going on to um, a set of questions uh, led by Michael Mara, and he may wish to uh, come back on that. Um, Michael, um, you are going to go on to talk about completion rates, but you yeah. may have a follow-up there. I mean, my understanding of the, 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 the significant uplift that Mr Hepburn refers to is essentially one project. There's one project, now, a very valid and worthwhile project in Fife in terms of the college investment strategy for this year. Um, so, I mean, perhaps if he feels that there's a, you know, another wide amount of money that we've not seen, he could write to us and tell us where it is, because I, I don't really see it. But, but this, I, this... I don't, sorry, no, Mr. Mara, let, let me come back on that, because I'm not actually understanding the point you're making. Are you suggesting that it's illegitimate for us to invest in that project? That's, no. That is something we're doing. It's, a, it's the type of response that you will see from the Scottish Government to invest in uh, Scotland's college estate. We've you've seen it in the recent past. If you look at the first class facilities, that we see at Fourth Valley at College, for uh, example, and I'm sure Mr. Mara has had the opportunity to visit them. They are first class. That's as a direct result of investment by this administration. Yeah. Uh, if I can, I'm still if waiting. You're... The final proposition for the Dunfermline Learning Campus, we're committed to investing in Scotland's College of State. Yeah. I'll go back to the point I've made already. There is significant constraint on public resource right now. That doesn't uh, just go for our revenue budgets, that is also the case for our capital budgets as well, and he will also understand that it's under further pressure as a result of things like inflationary pressure. Yeah, so, so it's, it's again, clear, it's clear, if, if, if I can can be now. us to invest more in this area, I am more um, than willing for him to come forward with suggestions as to where that money can come from. But we are committed thank to you. investing. Thank you, Minister. This year. That's the type of action we'll see from this government. Thank you, Minister. Um, yeah. Misrepresentation of, of, of what I said. What I said was that it was a very welcome project in Fife. The minister referred to an ageing uh, infrastructure across the country, ageing at the same rate, and then said he was making significant investment. Actually, they're funding one project. So I'm going to move on from that area. A worthwhile project, and I said that very clearly, Minister. Um, now, the, uh, I want to ask you about completion rates. Um, we've heard in the course of our inquiry um, a, quite a, a number of people uh, raising issues about. Uh, uh, worries about completion rates uh, in uh, Scotland's colleges. Um, I just uh, wonder if we can start off with whether you are concerned by the rate of completion uh, of, uh, of courses uh, for students in Scotland's colleges. I would like to see them improved. I would certainly uh, agree with that uh, um, proposition. Uh, I would suggest that we have obviously seen some disruption, inevitable disruption in the past uh, couple of years as a consequence of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we are seeing recovery uh, from that. That is very welcome. But yes, of course, I would, uh, I would like to see uh, higher levels of uh, completion rate. I, I would uh, suggest that we still see very positive outcomes in terms of uh, post-study uh, destination, uh, and that is very uh, welcome. But yeah, of course, we want to see uh, higher levels of completion rate. That's something that I, I'm very uh, committed to working with uh, the sector in terms of how we can uh, improve on that. But uh, so, what are you doing? Um, so, what are you doing to make that happen? 
So we're engaging uh, directly through SFC, uh, through uh, with Colleges Scotland, directly with uh, colleges themselves to see. Can, can you tell me uh, anything specific that isn't about? Made, can you tell us anything specific that isn't about engagement? Maybe to allow me to answer any questions you ask me, Mr. Um, Marlon. Yeah, can I? Talk. Um, I mean, I'm all for robust discussion and scrutiny, but uh, two people talking at the same time is not helpful to anybody at all. Um, so, Minister, um, can I take it that you have finished uh, with your bit just now? Um, Mr Mara, did you want to come back on? Um, I'll allow you thank, to come back Thank you. In. I mean, we've heard quite a bit about engagement and meetings. I, I'm, I'm interested, I think, as other members are, in practical actions. So, so what is happening? Um, and if I can, if I can illustrate some of that, that would be great, Minister. It would be good to hear about what's happening rather than what's in your diary. Um, but I would also ask, do you think that issues of completion should be uh, how we, one of the ways that we are assessing what is happening in, you know, in our colleges? Um, so what, uh, we had a representation from the SFC saying they were considering that completion rates, making sure that this was one of the areas that we could have a better understanding of. Um, I think well, we all have concerns perhaps about those statistics and how they're provided, but we want to know that actually it's not just about the number of students going in, but how many are completing and whether you would make that, for instance, a condition of widening access. So a policy decision that you might be able to take rather than a meeting you might be able to have. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm Sorry, it's silly to suggest what I was saying is just about meetings and engagement we've been having. Although I, I, I would hope Mr. Ma would recognise it's not unreasonable for me to actually speak with those who are delivering on the ground to uh, understand how we might go about improving things. And you know, occasionally it does require uh, the odd meeting or two for us to take that uh, forward. But in terms of the fundamental point that uh, you make, Mr. Mara, yes, of course, of course, uh, that should be uh, one of the things that we're uh, looking at. And of course, in terms of the widening access journey. I, I, a lot of this probably relates more to the activity. And I know we've got a discussion ahead in terms of uh, universities. Of course, colleges are a, a critical conduit into uh, universities. But of course, uh, it's critical that, as a first step, we get people through the door. But that, that's not the end of uh, the matter. Uh, where people uh, end up in terms of uh, their experience of education, in terms of uh, the process to qualification, and indeed, where they end up beyond uh, qualification are all vital aspects of the widening access uh, agenda. So, uh, I think probably, uh, despite the robust nature of our exchanges, which I'm always relaxed to have with uh, you, Mr. Mara, is that we are probably as one on that particular issue. Um, I do have um, quite a few people who want to come in as supplementaries, so I'm going to take them in the order that um, I saw them. So, um, Stephanie Callahan, please, um, and then Stephanie will be followed uh, by uh, Bob Doris. Bob Doris will be followed by Stephen Kerr, and we'll end with Graham. Hopefully, we can get you all in if you're succinct with your questions. Uh, Stephanie Callahan. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I ask the Minister what particular consideration has been given to improving completion rates for students with additional support needs and disabilities, and what impact has regionalisation had on these students? Thanks. Well, I, on the, the, the latter uh, point, if you look at the participation uh, rate for some of these uh, groups, uh, we have seen uh, progress. That has uh, been uh, welcome, and again, I think that's down to the fact that our, um, our regionalisation process has enabled uh, colleges to be uh, more uh, flexible and more uh, responsive. So that is an important uh, part of uh, what uh, that we we seek to do. Uh, of course, and it goes back effectively. It's the same answer I've just given to uh, to uh, Mr. Mara. Uh, uh, getting people through the door. Is only one part of the equation. Is there more to be done in terms of uh, thinking through how we can uh, better support uh, people to uh, make sure that they can complete uh, their uh, journey through uh, the uh, college uh, experience? And yes, of course there is, and uh, uh, that is something that remains the ongoing subject of discussion with uh, the sector. Uh, Bob so, just as a follow-up. Sorry. Sorry. Do continue, Stephanie. I beg your pardon. <laughs> 
apologies, convener. So just as a, a, a quick follow-up to that, Minister, um, do you think students with ASA and uh, additional support needs and disabilities then are, are able to have enough influence on college decision-making, for example, at college board level? Um, obviously, these are things that, that, that can help improve the conditions for them and make it, make it more... Uh, uh, make it more likely that they're able to succeed and complete. Thanks. Well, I, certainly from the evidence I saw uh, that was given to you by the student representatives who came uh, to to speak with you, uh, that they uh, perceived the ability for the student voice to be heard in the college environment to uh, be uh, very real. Uh, I know you spoke with. Uh, Nicole uh, Cochran from West Lothian uh, uh, College Student Association, who uh, uh, talked of uh, that, saying uh, that there was the ability to interact, um, that Al Wilson at Edinburgh College Student Association uh, said uh, the same. Uh, Amy Monks at Dundee and Angus College Students Association uh, talked uh, about this uh, in terms of the ability to influence uh, service uh, design uh, methodology. So. Uh, the, and I know that there was uh, a positive impact in terms of uh, the organisation of student associations as a consequence of regionalisation. Many of the uh, pre-existing smaller colleges didn't have that infrastructure uh, at all. So I would expect uh, every college to be ensuring that the student voice is uh, heard. I would expect them to be reflecting on how uh, the student body it's constituted to make sure that every element of it is, uh, is heard. Going back to the, the point I, I made earlier, uh, in terms of who uh, Scotland's colleges are uh, supporting, uh, over a fifth of uh, learning hours uh, in 2020 21 were delivered to students with a declared disability. That's a substantial proportion of the student body. And of course, their voice should be heard. And if I had any suggestion it wasn't being, then that's something I would have no hesitation in picking up. Um, thank you, Minister. Thank we'll you. move on to uh, Bob Doris. Minister, we heard from, in fact, it was Glasgow Kelvin College, uh, Derek Smeal and others, the committee, that there was concern over how we um, estimate completion rates in Scotland's colleges. For example, if a young person starts the course for a few days, doesn't like it, switches another course, that may be a a non-completion or gets offered a, a well-paid job in a sector they're already trained for, that is a non-completion. And it might be a very different way of gathering the statistics in Scotland than there is in England. And I think Audit Scotland have already raised these concerns as well. So whilst I absolutely agree with you we want to improve the current levels of non-completions, we need to make sure they reflect on a consistent basis what's actually happening in colleges and make sure that what we're measuring is positive outcomes and not arbitrary data that might not actually be relevant. Is that something that you would take on board? Well, I think that's right. So, well, in two senses. First of all, the comparison with um, England has to be viewed with caution because they are measured very differently. The sectors are also very different uh, as well in terms of Scotland's colleges deliver far more uh, higher education uh, than uh, uh, English uh, colleges uh, do. So I would always be cautious about drawing uh, conclusions uh, as a consequence of uh, comparison. But there is absolutely a legitimate question, and it is something that we need to uh, consider in terms of uh, what we view as um, uh, completion uh, rate and Derek Smeal has obviously articulated this quite clearly. Indeed, when uh, we visited the college, this was something he discussed with us uh, both. And it's something that I, I'm more than willing for us to, to continue to reflect on. Uh, I bring in Stephen... thing, as well, is that we need to be cautious about <laughs> cautious about how <laughs> I say this because. Yes, we absolutely want more students to complete their course, but in many instances, people are, uh, students aren't completing because they're moving on to another positive uh, destination. So we need to also be cautious about drawing the conclusion that non-completion is uh, equals failure. That is not uh, the case. Now, can we better reflect that in terms of how we monitor and measure things? Yes, I think we probably can. And that's something we need to reflect on. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can I bring in Stephen Kerr, please? But that's Bob Doris's whole point, Minister. We don't know. Why don't we know? 
why don't we know why these figures are being reported the way they are? Why can't we drill down and find out the details at line level? As a minister, surely you are exercised by the fact that we've got this reported number, which then everyone says, actually, that's not the real number. I mean, why is this still going on? Why isn't this fixed? Why isn't this a priority for you and those who work with you? Well, I haven't said at any stage it isn't a priority for me, uh, Mr. Kerr. When, so when will you it draw be that fixed then? Conclusion from. So when will it, it is be one fixed? of the things that we are actively looking at. The SFC spoke to you about this. Um, you know, we can't magically resolve it overnight. It's something we're looking at. It's something we're determined to uh, try and resolve to sat in a satisfactory uh, basis. Uh, it's trying to get the balance right. And I've talked about some of the challenges, uh, the inherent challenges involved in uh, doing so. But we are looking at it. Which, I, you know, I would, ho I would hope the committee would well. Sorry, Minister. If this was in any other environment, that answer you've given would simply not be acceptable. Reflecting on things and looking at things is not what this, what I personally on this committee would like to hear you say. I'd like to hear you say that we're going to get a proper analysis of what the uh, uh, completion rate is, the dropout rate is. We're going to look at every element, every reason why people apparently don't complete the courses that they register for, and we're going to get that done within the next month? Well, I, I think I would be leading the committee astray. I think Mr Kerr knows this fine well to say that I'll be able to resolve that in a month. Well, well how it long will it take then? How long will it take then? I, I, I can't sit here and say. What I can tell you is... What's your ambition? What's your ambition then? What's your ambition again? What's your ambition is, is to do it I, I'm telling you, if you let me answer... Okay. My ambition is to do it as soon as possible to try and resolve some of the uh, the issues that have been raised by Mr Doris primarily uh, and uh, Mr Mara before him and now by you, Mr Kerr. I recognise that we can improve these things and I'm committed to doing that. We will look at it. You can't improve anything. Thank you. you don't know where you're that, starting Mr. from. Mr. Kerr, that's, that's sufficient. I think we have explored that as far as we can. Um, I'm going to move us on to talking about the college estate. Um, Minister, uh, what is the Scottish Government's uh, response to Audit Scotland's report highlighting that since 2018-19, college capital funding has fallen by £321 million short of of the amount required for the life cycle and backlog maintenance? Well, I think what that reflects is the scale of the challenge we're trying to respond to. And we have to respond to it on the basis of all of the constraints in public finance uh, that I have referred to. And that's not just a challenge in terms of revenue budgets, it's also a challenge in terms of uh, capital allocation uh, as well. Uh, what I've asked uh, and I've uh, discharged SFC with doing is coming back to me uh, with uh, laying out uh, a plan to respond to some of those challenges. What are the priorities uh, in terms of uh, the coming uh, period? So I know that you spoke with SFC about that. That's something that they are going to uh, take forward. Uh, they will then make a series of recommendations to me. It will be incumbent on the government to, to consider them. I recognise the scale of the challenge. Uh, is not something I am pretending is not there, and there are various reasons uh, that it exists. The primary one being, by my estimation, is that we have a series of buildings that were built around the same time, and as a result of them being built at the same time, they are maturing at the same age. I would go back to the point I've made in response to Mr Mara. We have a track record of investing in the college uh, estate, already laid out the commitment we laid out for. And Mr Mara was right to refer to it as one project. I wasn't shying away from being one project. It's one very important project, and it's a serious financial commitment from uh, the Scottish Government to continue to invest in and improve the college estate in Scotland. But in terms of how we uh, respond to the, the significant challenges ahead of us, uh, that's something I'm looking forward to the SFC. Informing, and then we need to consider how to, to respond to those recommendations. Um, do we have a time scale on that? Uh, I'm looking forward to provide that next year. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I just sort of like follow up uh, on that um, about what support the Scottish Government is offering to colleges to achieve their net zero targets? 
Well, that's all part of the, the same equation. So to, to do that, realistically, that's going to require capital investment and I'm not going to pretend otherwise. So, again, that will be part of the... I expect that to be part of the considerations of uh, the SFC report and um, that will inform the decisions we take. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'd like to move on now to Ross Greer, um, who is going to hopefully lead a few questions around staffing. Thanks, convener. Good morning, Minister. In the first instance, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the level of uh, pay in Scotland's colleges, but specifically senior management and principal level. Do you think it's justifiable that there are multiple college principals in Scotland who earn more than the First Minister? Uh, I think that's something that uh, colleges themselves uh, would have to speak to and uh, justify. Uh, we don't uh, direct, we don't dictate, we are not involved in the process of uh, pay settlements in the college sector. Uh, I think it is right, though, and you'll see this reflected in our own public sector uh, pay policy, that uh, we are, particularly where we're dealing with constraint in public finances, that those who are at the bottom of the salary scale should be prioritised ahead of those at the top of the salary scale, if I could put it that way, Mr Greer. Thank you. Um, I would certainly agree with that sentiment. But if you look at uh, salary or uh, pay growth within the sector over the last 30 years, uh, senior management, particularly principal pay growth, has completely outstripped by a huge margin that of lecturers or, or support staff. Um, I appreciate, Minister, that you shared with the committee the lessons learned report that Strathlink have, have recently completed. But I got a distinct sense of déjà vu reading it. In fact, they, they note in their report that the most consistent theme is about the, the um, crushing lack of trust that there is between the parties and the NGNC negotiations. I think they refer to it as a debilitatingly low level of trust. They observed the fact that that conclusion isn't new. It was the key conclusion in John Sturrock's similar review that he conducted five years ago. Why has no progress been made on resolving the core issue that's resulting in such regular industrial action? Well, there is a role for us to play uh, in terms of engagement and on a constructive basis, constructive engagement with both uh, management and uh, unions. I do that. I'm committed to continuing uh, doing that. I certainly perceive it from my own um, uh, position to be positive engagement with uh, both. Uh, and I hope that's felt to be trying to demonstrate some form of leadership and engaging with both parties on a positive basis to try and urge them to come together uh, to negotiate in a similar vein. Now, I can't drive or determine what the relationships between both might be. All I can do is engage with them on that basis try and urge them to have dialogue on a respectful uh, basis and the basis of trying to come together to resolve some of the undoubted challenges that uh, e exist and where there are differences of opinion to try and bridge them. I accept that the relation that both the union and college management have um, individually with Scottish Government is better than the relationship they, they have with each other, but given that this conclusion was the, exactly the same one that, uh, that John Sturrock came to five years ago. Like, what specifically has the Scottish Government done in that intervening period of time to try and play a constructive role in facilitating a better relationship between unions and management? Rather than your direct relationship with each of them, what role have you played in this period of time in trying to resolve what John Sturrock concluded about their relationship with each other? Well, I think that role that I've talked about is and of itself a manner of uh, responding to the lessons learned exercise. But with respect, the lessons learned exercise should be lessons that each party involved has to learn uh, and has to reflect on and has to respond and adjust to. So with the greatest will in the world, again, I can't compel other parties to, to act in a particular fashion but I would urge, just as we've done, you know, we will look at that exercise and reflect on if what we might need to do, but so do the other parties as well. Um, now, I will continue to engage uh, with them, engage with them uh, on a bilateral uh, basis. I'm also more than willing, and there are some 
at forums where, albeit, and I'll readily concede, not specifically on uh, this uh, subject matter, but there have been some forums where uh, unions and management are in uh, the same room along with the Scottish Government. Now, that's not me, and I want to be very clear on this. I'm not looking for the Scottish Government to become a direct party to pay negotiations. We said, and I saw uh, the union perspective on this, that the structure is uh, right. It's about making sure that those who are involved, the parties in negotiation, uh, can get around the table and uh, harness the benefits of the structure that's been established to try and resolve any differences between them. Will the Scottish Government be issuing a, a fuller response to the exercise? Except what you're saying, it's primarily for the unions and college management to respond to. But there's, a, there's a role for government here and their conclusions in, in relation to the government. Will there be a, a fuller response from yourself to the contents of the report? Yes, yes, there will. I'm sorry if I wasn't being clear. I wasn't saying it was just, it's not a primary response on uh, unions and management. We are also um, still part of the, the wider process of uh, engagement and we are also part of the uh, the process of assessment of the, the lessons learned exercise. So I'm not seeking to distance ourselves from that at all. Um, we are a party to uh, the, the consideration of that report, and yes, we'll uh, be responding in, in full detail. Thanks very much, that, Minister. Could I just clarify what timescale the committee should expect to, to see the government's response on? I, I don't think it will. I think it'll be in fairly short order, but I'm also keen that uh, other colleagues have the chance to reflect on it as well. Um, Thanks, Minister. Thank you, Mr Greer. Could I bring in Stephanie Callaghan, please? Thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, taking on that, of that on board, that there are some really good examples. For example, North, Co uh, North College Lanarkshire, our new College Lanarkshire, we can't even get the name right, built really, really strong relationships and trust right across their team of a thousand plus employees and that's right through from janitorial to your teaching staff there. They've got food pantries, free breakfast. So they've really, really gone about creating that culture of goodwill and mutual respect with a joint focus on prioritising learning. So still there are very challenging conversations, but still Certainly, you know, this makes it a lot easier for them. And I'm wondering what further opportunities um you perhaps see um the Scottish Government to, to help create and share good leadership practice, the ideas, the success, the learning, to help colleges actually share that right across Scotland's sector? Well, where any good practice exists, both at management in should recognise that because they will be involved in, in that process. So I'm all for uh, good practice being it drawn down upon to inform the, the wider uh, process. And again, uh, where there's a, a role where we are aware of such, I, I won't hesitate to, to refer to that and point to that as uh, good, uh, positive uh, examples for the wider consideration of the whole sector. Thank you, Minister. So are there any steps the Scottish Government could be taking then to, to, to help create opportunities, more opportunities to actually share that good practice across colleges? I beg your pardon, Ms Callan. I missed just the very start of your question. Apologies. So I'm wondering, is there anything anything that you feel the Scottish Government can do um, to, to, to help support the creation um, of further sharing right across the college sector then to embed this good practice more widely? It, well, simply put, <laughs> do the dialogue, the regular dialogue, and I'm happy to provide details of the frequency with which I speak with College of Scotland uh, and the, all of the different unions in the college environment, uh, that's an opportunity for, of course, uh, the representatives in the college sector to raise any issue they want uh, to raise with me, but also for me to reflect on uh, anything back uh, to them. So if um, uh, you and others as individual members of the Scottish Parliament want to make me aware of uh, things that should be highlighted, I'm more than willing to hear that. Indeed, I'm more than willing to hear it directly from individual uh, colleges and then urge others to, to reflect upon it. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to uh, Ruth Maguire, who will be asking questions around articulation. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, articulation is obviously an important tool in widening access. Um, 
four out of ten um, SIMD entrants to university come through the college route. Um, in evidence, principals told us that this is um, something, a, a reflection of the additional credibility that regionalisation has, has given colleges. Um, the other figure that we were given was that 58% of articulating students are granted advanced standing, i.e. they go on to the second or third years. Now, one principal said that that's something that he would have said would have been impossible 15 years ago um, before this. So it is obviously a success. But in your mind, um, is enough being done? And what more can be done to encourage further progress? Well, what I'm, first of all, I would in some of that evidence, and I very much uh, agree with uh, what was being said to the committee by college principals, not just college principals, of course, you, you heard from uh, other uh, folk given uh, evidence uh, from the business uh, community and others saying that similar types of uh, relationship have been uh, established and that might not have been possible uh, in days uh, gone by uh, uh, as well. Uh, so, the figures that you have uh, quoted, Ms Maguire, I think are a very positive indication of the benefits of regionalisation. I continue to see uh, more uh, being done in that regard. I had a very useful uh, visit to uh, Queen Margaret University recently, and they talked about some of the very clear uh, pathways that have been established in conjunction with uh, various colleges where a student uh, uh, entering the college environment will understand at the outset that that pathway is available to them rather than they get their HNC, HND, uh, and then they have to think of what, what next. They are aware at the outset that this is an opportunity uh, for them. And I want to see more of that type of, of activity. And I want to see the sector leading them that themselves. Now, the, the positive uh, news is I do think that's happening. I think uh, that is happening uh, in an enhanced way in a number of uh, locations. Uh, these aren't exclusive examples, but Froth Valley uh, College is a very good uh, set up with Stirling University in terms of uh, articulation uh, pathways. We see similar with Nescol and uh, Robert Gordon at University. There are other examples uh, uh, as well. Um, what I would say I'd like to see it happening more is uh, that advanced articulation that you refer to. So it's very welcome that we see uh, the numbers that have been referred to. But frankly, where um, a person having acquired their qualification at college wants to then go on to university and they can do so entering at the second or third year, I'd like to see that happening more than we're seeing uh, uh, just now. So that's again to our learner journey activity. It's something that we want to work with the college and university sector on. All that said, and I think it is important uh, if you may allow me, convener, to make the point because colleges, yes, they're a very valuable means of articulation, but we should also reflect that when someone gets an HNC or an HND, it's a very valuable qualification in its own right and something that should be celebrated. And if someone wants to take that and go into the, the world of work uh, on that basis, that should be celebrated and welcomed as well. Thank you, convener. Yeah, if, and, and actually f following on for that, from that, um, my colleague Bob Doris has raised in a number of um, evidence sessions the importance of um, the work that colleges do for those furthest away from education. And I'm, I'm sure that well, you've just you've just shown shown us there that we're, colleges are not just for feeding students to universities. Um, that work is is and requires quite a bit of investment. Um, and I suppose I, I just um, Graham Day covered with you the the the. The, the topic of the flexibility around college budget budgets. I wonder if you would just, in principle, agree that um, because some of these ex more expensive, although it is high value, um, projects can get cut in times of challenge, that actually it's crucial that um, while we're in, in, in the sort of climate that we're in with all budgets um, constrained and tested, that every flexibility is given to public bodies to 
deliver those important but often um, costly um, services to our, 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 our citizens. That really takes me back to the discussion we had uh, earlier and uh, a response I gave, I think it was to, to Mr Day, but certainly made the, uh, the point that um, right now we probably could be considering uh, the, the degree of latitude that we give uh, to colleges to more creative in the responses to their, their local community. Need. And I think that's a very clear uh, example because the, the refer uh, back you mentioned um, uh, Bob Doris. I've already referred to the visit I undertook with him to uh, Glasgow Kelvin uh, College. We saw some really good uh, example of that of what I would broadly term community learning and development type uh, activity that might not be so much focused on credit based funded uh, activity which is of enormous value, because it goes back to the point uh, that uh, Mr Mara was touching on in terms of widening access. That could be the gateway to uh, further uh, study for uh, the people who uh, actually interact with that type of provision. So I, I view it as very important. I, I do think it's something that we could uh, support better, and that is really taking us into the, the territory of some of the, the considerations we have to give around whether or not we need to provide colleges a bit more latitude in terms of how they use the, the public resource we provide for them. Whilst, of course, I always have to make the point, still need to account for the utilisation of public resource to demonstrate it's being used for public benefit. Thank you. I appreciate those answers. I suppose I would just say that it feels like the, 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 the citizens who would use those services are going to be in for a, a really hard time. As um, so, it, a bit of urgency around around that would be would be appreciated. Um, thank you, Ruth. Um, Can I just respond to that quickly? Can you oh, make um, a point? Yes, this yes, you do have a minute. So this is something we are looking at now. So it's not a forever and a day type thing. It's it's something that. I was in dialogue with College of Scotland around just last week. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, so we're now moving on to uh, looking at the future. Um, and I'm going to bring in uh, Bob Doris here. Um, thanks, Convener. Again, it's also quite an appropriate um, progression in the evidence session because looking at the future of colleges more generally, I want to give specific reference to Glasgow. When college regionalisation first happened, Convener, there was a concern that community-based colleges would be squeezed out and that very localised provision, including the, the if you like, the, the pre-education, pre-employability stuff that, 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 that Ruth McGuire and myself have, have, have raised in previous evidence sessions. Originalisation hasn't made that happen, uh, Minister. There's been a real flourishing of that community-based grassroots development from those furthest away from education to get involved in colleges, including Glasgow Kel Kelvin College, and thank you for, for the visit we've spoken about. But there are further reforms down, down the line, and the Scottish Funding Council report, I think it was last year, spoke about the need for Glasgow's colleges to work closer together. I was concerned at that time that could mean further merger within the Glasgow region, something that I've consistently opposed and th think would be a, a negative thing. Um, the, the Glasgow College Regional Board has been described as transactional and a duplication in relation to the Glasgow Colleges Group, which are the principals getting together with a senior team and get with doing that job of delivering for Glasgow and beyond. So can I ask the Minister what assurances he can give that Glasgow's three highly successful colleges are secure in their future, that their grassroots work will continue, and that if any reform is needed in Glasgow, despite the good work they've done up until this point, perhaps it's the regional board that is maybe up until now done a good job but may have served its purpose. It's also worth noting, Convener, I know this is lengthy, I understand that the Funding Council has asked the Glasgow College Regional Board to decide what future reform may look like, including whether there's a future role for the Regional Board. That seems pretty unfair on the Regional Board having to decide potentially on their own future. So I want to unpack there, Minister, for time constraints, Convener, I won't come back in, but I wanted to throw it all in at the same time, because I wasn't sure whether we'd get a supplementary on that. Um, there you go, Minister. A lot for you to unpack, but I'm sure you're up to it. Uh, off you go. 
I certainly do my best. I admire Mr. Doris's methodology of asking his supplementaries in, in one uh, uh, question. I mean, there are, are a few things at play there. <clears throat> First, in the, taking the last point, uh, I don't think it's any definitely not meant to be felt to be an unfair process in asking the board to consider various propositions to inform SFC's considerations about what they might recommend to me. So, just to be absolutely clear, you know, the regional board won't make any specific decision in terms of what the structure might be, but it's absolutely appropriate that they're asked to, to consider various issues and to be involved in any process. In terms of the, I think, the fairly fundamental question, the one which has been returned to a number of times around guarantees for the colleges in terms of Glasgow. All I can guarantee is that I am not driving any particular process of merger in the city of Glasgow. I'm not aware of there being one underway at all. So any proposition would need to emerge from the institutions themselves. If you look at what's happening in other parts of the country, in uh, the UHI region, for example, colleges themselves are uh, in dialogue. I didn't make that request. The SFC didn't make that request. We want to empower institutions to make decisions for themselves. So I can certainly give Mr. Dawes the reassurance that I'm not going to drive that particular agenda. I think it is important, though, um, and um, hopefully it would be agreed that it's not unreasonable for there to be a, a forum by which uh, the three colleges in Glasgow can have dialogue to make sure that we're maximising uh, the type of provision uh, that uh, there will be across the city as a whole, and we. Uh, reduce duplication if there are uh, any gaps in provision that that can be worked through to make sure those gaps are filled between uh, the three colleges. So, trying to get that balance right is, uh, of course, appropriate. Uh, SFC are, are considering what the uh, structure might look like in uh, Glasgow. They'll make a recommendation to me. Uh, I think that's an appropriate thing to do because, frankly and candidly, we only have three multi-college regions uh, right now. One, of course, is on the basis of it also being a, a university institution, so I think people understand why that is in place. The other two being Lanarkshire and Glasgow, and I think it is appropriate to consider whether or not that is still required. Thank you. Um, Pam Gosal has indicated she would like to come in at this point. Thank you, convener. Minister, I would like to go back to one of the questions that were asked earlier on, on dropout rates in colleges. Obviously, we know that colleges there's a lot of dropout rates, and we, uh, and we discussed that earlier on. In relation to that, would Minister think of changing data collection so that when people switch colleges or courses or they transfer to other colleges, that it doesn't count as a dropout? So uh, that was the very point I was, was trying to make in response to, to Mr Kerr, albeit I was pretty clear I couldn't do it within a, a month. I don't think that would be a reasonable timescale or one that would do uh, uh, the issue justice. I think that is a, a perfectly legitimate thing uh, for us to consider. The issue that uh, you have raised, Ms Gosal, I am absolutely uh, committed to doing so. Just lastly on this, Minister, I mean, I am speaking to a lot of businesses, and colleges are so vital for the, that skills journey, so that businesses can get the right skills. And I can't emphasise enough today, as a visitor to this committee, that please, Minister, do think about all the questions that have been asked today by all the colleagues, that we really, really need to invest in colleges, and we really need to help them, whether it's through the capital funding, whether it's pupils. Uh, we really need to do much more, and I can't emphasise enough that colleges, have, how much they come and speak to me about this and the fact the funding is being cut. And you talk about, basically, earlier on, that where to get this funding from. You are the minister, so you should be telling us, to be honest, where you should be looking at where to make, not cuts, but actually look at where you can move money around and look at the best for colleges, because businesses are really, really crying out for those skills. So let me respond to that. Uh, there are a couple of points there. Of course, I will we hear what the committee has got to say. I think this is a very valuable inquiry and committed to determine what it does at the end of this inquiry. I presume 
some form of report that we pulled together with recommendations, I'll, of course, give uh, those my consideration. But just to be very clear with Ms. Gosel, uh, she says the calls are coming to her regularly for discussion. It might not be a surprise to her to learn that they do that with me too. So I maintain regular dialogue with them. And just on the last point, yes, of course, as uh, the minister with responsibility for higher education, further education policy, amongst uh, other uh, policy areas, is incumbent on me to consider how we deploy public resource. But I'm afraid to say it is incumbent. We all have a leadership role. We're all elected representatives. And if you, Ms. Gosel, or any other representative wants to come forward to say there should be additional resource in any particular area of government expenditure, I would respectively say that we can take that proposition a lot more seriously if it can be identified as to where that resource comes from. Yes, government has that primary leadership role, but it's not an exclusive one. It's one for us all as elected representatives, because after all, the budget process is one that's subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Um, thank you for that, Minister. Um, we now have actually come to the end of our time on the College Regionalisation Inquiry, and I would like to not only thank the Minister today, um, but to all those who, who have contributed to all the sessions that we have had, and to colleagues on the committee. Uh, we will now move on to our next item of business, which is questions on universities. However, before we do that, we will have a suspension for around five minutes to allow for a change of witnesses.
Uh, welcome back. We are now going to have a short session on universities. Can I welcome back uh, the uh, Minister for Higher Education, Further Education, Youth Employment and Training, Jamie Hepburn. Um, also, uh, Stephen Patharina, uh, Director, Advanced Learning and Science. And can I also welcome Shazia Razak, Strategic Lead, uh, University Policy, Governance and Equalities, and and Roddy MacDonald, Head of Higher Education and Science Division, who are also joining us for this session. As with the previous session, I would expect that most, if not all, of the questions will be directed towards the Minister. However, should anyone else wish to come in on any of the questions, please put a capital R in the chat bar. The clerks will be monitoring the chat bar and I will bring you in whenever I can. Members and witnesses should be aware there is an active court case, uh, active case in court relating to the university's superannuation scheme, and therefore the case is sub judice. I would therefore ask members and witnesses to refrain from referring to matters relating to the case. I will now move on to the question session and we're going to have um, Graham Day um, and I will come on in on that as well regarding student accommodation. Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, morning again, Minister. Um, as you're well aware, there have been some significant but localised issues around access to student accommodation pertaining to certain universities. Uh, this year. I'm wondering when situations like these arise, or the extent to which the government uh, records, monitors um, the availability of student accommodations in such localities, and the extent to which dialogue uh, is entered into with the specific universities uh, in seeking to um, achieve an outcome. Mr Hepburn, Don't did you it. hear that question? Clearly not. It doesn't look as though Mr Hepburn has that question. Um, I believe that the technical team are working on it at the moment. Um, I would like to bring the meeting to a short suspension in order that we may uh, deal with our technical difficulties. Thank you. Um, Minister, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. You Fan. Need to forgive me, convener. I couldn't hear to the extent I hadn't even realised the session had started until I could see a very confused looking Mr. Day. Okay, so we'll need to indicate when we're going to end up. Right, uh, one, one minute to go. I'll indicate that. Thank you. Um, welcome back. After a short suspension in order to sort out our technical difficulties, I am taking the liberty to repeat the introduction so that we may have a fair start um, again to this session. 
Could I please welcome back uh, Jamie Hepburn, the Minister for Higher Education, Further Education, Youth Employment and Training, uh, Stephen Patherina, and uh, who is the Director, uh, Advanced Learning and Science. Can I also welcome Shazia Razak, Strategic Lead, University Policy, Governance and Equalities, and Roddy MacDonald, Head of Higher Education and Science Division, who are joining us for this session. As with previous session, I would expect that most, if not all, the questions will be directed towards the Minister. However, should anyone else wish to come in, could they please put a capital R in the chat box, which will be monitored by the clerks, and I will bring you in when I can. Members and witnesses should be aware there is an active case in court relating to the university superannuation scheme, and therefore the case is sub judice. I would therefore ask members and witnesses to refrain from referring to matters relating to the case. We will now move on to the questioning session, um, and we are starting off with uh, Graeme Day, who I may come in on those questions. Mr Day. Good morning again, Minister. Um, as you're well aware, we have in recent times had very um, locality-specific issues with uh, student accommodation uh, for universities. I'm wondering uh, about the government's uh, role uh, around this, uh, perhaps starting off with a with position around um, recording and monitoring the availability of student housing in relation to each university, and thereafter, when an issue arises, what dialogue and what role uh, government officials have in engaging with these individual universities uh, in seeking to achieve a, an appropriate outcome? First of all, I'm glad I can hear you now, uh, Mr. Day. Apologies for any confusion that uh, existed before. Um, I, I do perceive uh, there to be a role for us. It isn't the leading one, though. We are not a direct provider of student accommodation. Never have been. There's never been a, a role for government in uh, that uh, regard, and I don't detect any sense that that it should uh, change. But that's not to say. It isn't of substantial concern to me in terms of my ministerial responsibilities as well. It is something that I've engaged very directly with specific universities around, in particular the University of Glasgow, where there was a very widely reported situation. I got a degree of reassurance they were taking every step they could to work through any of the remaining issues they had at that stage. What we are committed to doing is uh, taking forward the student uh, accommodation uh, strategy, uh, which will be informed by the purpose-built student accommodation uh, review that uh, is underway. We uh, recently uh, commissioned uh, uh, evidence uh, from the UK Collaborative Centre for housing that's now with us. That will be considered by the Purpose Built uh, Student Accommodation Review a Steering Group, and then we will, of course, publish it. And I'll be happy to to directly uh, write to the committee at the juncture that we we do that. And that will form the considerations about what we might be able to do to try and make sure that there is better provision of uh, housing for uh, students. Of course, this is part of a, a wider uh, challenge in terms of the pressure of availability. Of housing, I would reflect on some of the work that we have already done in terms of short-term lets, for example, and better enabling uh, local authorities to regulate that market to ensure there is wider uh, supply of uh, housing for other uh, groups who uh, require it, students included. So, there is action we can take. Uh, we can't take it alone. We have to work with uh, the sector to make sure that they are living up to their responsibilities to ensure that uh, the students they recruit can be adequately housed, and that is something we will continue to work through with our student accommodation strategy. Uh, uh, one follow-up question on that, Minister. I obviously welcome uh, the actions that you have identified, but given what we know and what happened this year, how uh, optimistic would you be that this work can be progressed in conjunction with the universities uh, at sufficient pace to hopefully ensure there will be no repetition uh, for the next academic year? 
Well, there's work that's underway, uh, and I certainly want to have it substantially advanced in advance of a uh, next uh, academic year. Uh, it would be disingenuous to suggest some of these wider pressures that we're seeing are going to go away anytime soon. What um, if you take University of Glasgow as an example? When I spoke to them, they have plans to increase the own uh, number of uh, uh, directly provided uh, student accommodation. That's the type of response that I would hope to see in the sector. I recognise, though, that's not going to be achieved readily. That requires lead-in time uh, in terms of planning application, in terms of construction, and, and so on. But that type of activity has to start has to start sooner rather than later. And of course, our own actions in terms of the student accommodation strategy have to as well. Um, Mr. Hiltman, we'll be aware that this is obviously a, a very concerning issue for me um, regarding my own constituency, um, having not only Glasgow University, but I believe I have eight institutes of uh, higher and further education, nine including the Open University. Um, so that puts particular pressures and can bring tensions between having a resident population but also being very welcoming and accommodating towards students as well. So it's a complicated picture there. Um, and I, I am aware that he has been working closely with Glasgow University, as have I. It might be useful for us to understand the bigger picture. Um, so could the minister give us an indication of what the pressures are around student accommodation across Scotland, and how does that fit in with the national picture across the UK? Um, so I suppose I'm trying to get to the bottom of, is this a uniquely Scottish thing? Is it a Glasgow thing, uh, a university town thing, or actually are the pressures being felt up and down the country? Well, I think on the last point, it's going to be particularly acute during the university term. It's certainly not a Glasgow-specific uh, thing. There are other uh, locations in Scotland that report similar challenges. It's certainly not a Scotland-specific uh, challenge as well. We see similar uh, challenges in other parts of the UK. Uh, Manchester is one example that uh, uh, comes uh, to mind. We'll see similar pressures in other uh, cities and uh, communities where there is the presence of a higher education uh, uh, institution. So it's not specific uh, to it's got by any stretch of the imagination. What we uh, have to do is to work with other uh, partners to try and respond to that reality and to try and make sure that there is uh, sufficiency of supply of uh, accommodation, recognising that there are other pressures as well. Each of us represent uh, constituencies and regions where we'll have many constituents who aren't students who are also looking to be housed and accommodated. So there's a role for us, um, not as a direct provider of housing, but to set the strategic direction in conjunction uh, with uh, the sector. And we'll do that through uh, the strategy that I've referred to. And we need to work with other partners as well. I've already referred to the, the powers of local authorities in respect of short-term lets regulation. We've empowered them to do that better as well. And they also candidly have to consider uh, how to balance the various requirements in terms of their own population and their housing needs as well. You have referred to some of the tensions that can exist, and I recognise that. And that has to be managed carefully by any local authority, ensuring that there is sufficiency of supply for the various housing requirements that exist in the locality. Uh, thank you, Mr Hepburn. Uh, we're just going to move swiftly on um, to cover uh, university finances. Um, and I am prepared to allow, uh, it's a short session, but a wee bit of time on this. Um, and Ruth Maguire is going to kick us off and Michael Mara uh, will come in. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, hello again, Minister. Um, my question probably um, whilst it is about university finances, it's more from the perspective of, of the students. You may have been aware that I raised in a former session, and I believe I have done so in writing directly to yourself as well, an example of an educational psychology student who um, does a work placement with a local authority, um, and during that placement is not classed as a student, therefore does not have access to council tax reduction or um, other benefits that the university might provide in terms of welfare fund or childcare assistance. Educational psychologists are obviously a, a profession that we're pretty short of. Um, 
I'll not go over all the, all the details. I, I think you probably would have would have seen from the former session. But I just wonder if there's anything the Scottish Government can do um, in terms of students like like these educational psych psychology students. There are, of course, other um, professions where uh, a, a, a grant is given. I'm supposed to be thinking of midwives and um, some nurses, perhaps. So it, it may well affect more than, than than that specific cohort. I'd be interested to hear your your views on it. So uh, some of these are very specific. You know, the example that's provided is a, a very a specific one, and I recognise the importance of recruiting into uh, that uh, profession. These are quite long-standing uh, arrangements, and they are designed in such a way that any individual should be able to draw down other forms of support that would not be available to them if they were otherwise still classified as a, a, a student. What I can say is uh, I'm conscious that it has been uh, raised uh, with uh, the government. Uh, we're, of course, happy to, to reflect on uh, that, but uh, I would observe uh, this is not um, something that's just been recently introduced. It's quite a long-standing arrangement. It's very much designed to reflect the fact, effectively, for that uh, period of time, the person isn't actually in the classroom environment. They're not actually undertaking any form of study. They're out there in uh, the workplace. But of course, we're, we're, we're more than willing to, 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 to look at these things. Minister, I, I suppose I'd probably comment that just because something's long-standing doesn't mean it, it doesn't need, need changing. Um, I know that's not what you're, you're inferring, but I just think it's, it's important to be clear. I, I think it just it, it feels important because these individuals are studying to do a, a profession that is in shortage, certainly in Ayrshire and Arran. Psychologists, are, there's a shortage of them. I think educational psychologists in particular, we know that there is a um, challenge around the demand for, for um, mental health support for, for children and young people. So um, thank you for noting my comments. Thank you. Uh, Mr Mara and Mr Mara will be followed by Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Convener. I am keen, Minister, to focus on long-term financial uh, trends and the, the impact of some of those in the, uh, in, in the university sector. So, um, we have had some exchanges on this particular issue in the Chamber already, um, and the, what, the latest REF results, the Research Excellence Framework, uh, would indicate that uh, the rest of the UK universities are uh, improving their performance at a faster rate than Scottish universities. So a great set of results for Scotland, but a worrying comparative trend across the UK. Um, and I know that it's shared by the sector. Um, I'd be keen to get on the record your response to that in terms of what you think about the long-term strategic approach and what that might mean for Scotland. Well, the first thing I would do, and I hope all of us would reflect on, is the position that we are actually in, in terms of higher education, research and development uh, just now. So if you look at the percentage of expenditure uh, across uh, public and private uh, resource in terms of uh, higher education, research and development, we are ranked seventh amongst OECD uh, countries. We spend as a percentage of our GDP above the OECD average, above the EU27 average and above uh, the UK. Uh, average. So it's important that we reflect uh, on uh, uh, that. In terms of what we seek to do, we did uh, increase the, the baseline uh, grants uh, for university research and innovation uh, this uh, year. So where we can, have to refer back uh, to the budgetary context we're in, which is a very challenging one. But where we can leverage an additional resource, then um, we will do so. That is a demonstration that we have it, it, it done so. And then I would also reflect on uh, the fact that, notwithstanding some of the trends, and of course, you know, I want to, I want to maintain the, the position that where Scotland's universities are doing comparatively better than drawing down the uh, funding that exists, UKRI funding, uh, for uh, example. Um, we still are uh, outperforming the uh, UK um, uh, as a whole in terms of population average. So 13% of uh, UKRI Research Council spend was drawn down to, 
to Scotland in terms of the most recent figures, that's well ahead of our population position. Yeah. I want to maintain that, and that's why, for example, I'll engage with UKRI to make sure that I understand how we can continue uh, to do that. that. That's not being maintained, is it, Minister? That gap is closing. So the, the actual our comparative capture of UKRI spending is, uh, is declining. You're, you're right, it's a good thing that we outperform the rest of the UK. We make a significant uh, investment as taxpayers into, the, uh, into our universities, and we want to see that performance uh, continue. But that gap is closing. And universities tell me that one of the, the drivers within that is um, there's a long term. And I understand your points about the, the, the short term budgetary considerations and you know the, the real pressure that's under. But for, there's been no increase in the unit of resource paid to uh, for Scottish students to universities in Scotland for 13 years. 13 years, and that is the key driver in terms of the business model that universities operate under. So is, is there not a long-term issue? And I'd be keen to get your, your own personal thoughts in terms of how important this sector is in terms of the economic performance of the country in the long run. You know, whatever the constitutional settlement is in the future that we may disagree on, but how important this is. And we have to maintain that advantage and increase it. So, so what is being done by the government to ensure that that can happen? Well, in terms of... Uh, my own personal reflection of the importance of the university sector is of the utmost importance in terms of uh, our position or standing in uh, the world in relation to the world-class research that we see across all of our institutions. If you look at the, uh, the REF uh, uh, results that uh, Mr Mara uh, referred to a few moments ago, we saw first-class research right across every single institution. That is something we should celebrate. That is something we should uh, shout about. And if I have uh, any uh, area of mild critique of the sector, is I think they could do a better job, and there is a role for us as well, in shouting about the activity that is happening here in uh, Scotland. Clearly, it is also an important driver of making sure that uh, we are responsive to the various skills requirements we have here in uh, Scotland. So, and of course, uh, as uh, economic uh, anchors of their own right and their own uh, community. So, the university sector is of uh, the utmost uh, importance. I don't want there to be any sense that I don't uh, recognise uh, that. In terms of uh, the resource we uh, invest, we continue to put in over £1 billion into the university sector each and every year. That is a substantial investment, I think, by any reasonable estimation. Were we to look again at uh, these things in terms of cost per unit, cost per head, I am afraid to say, and I am bound to say, it is going to be difficult to do that in the context of where the budget is uh, just now. Uh, and There is no point in pretending anything otherwise than that, Mr Mara. On, on the the University, University of Scotland have written to the committee and told us that we have now reached what they describe as a significant tipping point where in 23-24, the amount of money being brought in to universities by international student recruitment will outstrip public funding for the first time. Um, now, we could talk about the, um, the rights and wrongs of that in terms of the budget process, but does it worry the minister that we are open to external shocks, that there's a vulnerability in our um, institutions are vital, as you put them rightly, public uh, universities, that um, a, a shock in international relations in the recruitment market when we are now so reliant on international students. Is that, is that a concern that the minister has? And what, what can we do to ensure that resilience is there? So, in, in the first instance, and I take the point and I will come on to it, I think it's important for us to reflect, hopefully collectively, International students are very welcome here to Scotland. They play an, an important part in our university communities and, indeed, in our, our wider society. I am alert to some of the challenges that Mr Mara refers to, and they are ones that I take seriously, and they are ones that we have to be cognisant of. We are committed to developing our international education strategy, and a core part of that has to be how we consider uh, to make sure and make clear that, that the sector can be resilient in the face of 
any particular type of shock that uh, you may refer to. So it's something we're alert to, it's something we're conscious of, and it is something that we want to work with the set to make sure there is a resilience embedded within our institutions. And this can be done, if, if, if I can. We'll allow you a small bit of thank, leeway. Thank, 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 <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. And the, it would be appreciated, I think, by the committee. Can we have a date on the international education strategy? Um, can we have any details on what you mean? You know, you're cognizant of the issue in terms of external shock, but what is actually being done to actually make our institutions more resilient, our sector more resilient? And the last point I had was um, a colleague on the committee made a suggestion at a previous uh, meeting that the idea that there might be differential fees um, between different parts of the university sector, a different rate or unit of resource. That's created some real concern within the sector. And maybe the minister would take the opportunity to either dismiss that or to confirm that that's something that's under active consideration by the government. Thank you. It's not under active consideration. Um, it's not something that we are looking at specifically. Uh, as we move forward, Various things can be considered, but that is not one that I would envisage as uh, particularly uh, uh, looking at because it would immediately embed an additional layer of complexity and unintended uh, consequences. So hopefully that can provide some reassurance uh, in that sense. In terms of trying to explain uh, what I mean by being cognizant of some of the, the challenges, I, I don't really know how to explain that in any more specific basis in that I am conscious and understand that we've just seen very real shock to the international order this year that continues that's having a wider influence on global affairs, not particularly on this particular area of life in Scotland, but it does demonstrate events come along and can change things. So um, what I mean by that is that we need to make sure that we work with the sector to recognise that events like that can happen and where that might have a particular impact on the sector as a whole, or more likely specific institutions, how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that institutions can continue to do, undertake the work that they, that they do? if any event it comes along. In terms of time scale, I am happy to, to follow up the uh, convener to the committee in a bit more detail in terms of the work that we are undertaking on the strategy. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, that follow-up regarding the time scale would be very um, helpful. Can I just bring in Stephen Kerr, please? I will be very brief um, with my questions. Um, the Minister suggests that this sector has not suffered from the geopolitical shocks of the events of this year and the consequences of the uh, supply chain crisis around the end of COVID, I would suggest that this sector is suffering more uh, in the same way that all sectors are suffering because of the global inflation impact and um, also the increasing international uncertainties. Um, Minister, the, the, the University of Scotland says specifically, and I would like to read this to you and get your view. Um, the quote is, even without the perpetual risk of a geopolitical shock, the extent of cross-subsidy now jeopardises the quality of education, experience and support that universities are able to offer. When that happens, international students will exercise their choice to go elsewhere. Your thoughts on that, please? Well, just on the first point, um, I wasn't suggesting there's been no impact. I suppose I was referring more to the fact, I think if I was picking up the man's point correctly, that there are particular markets in terms of uh, the number of students that are attracted to, uh, to, to Scotland. That's not been uh, substantially uh, disrupted by the events of uh, this year. Clearly, in common with every sector, and incidentally, this is adding to the budget pressures we face, of course, there has been an impact as a result of the wider geopolitical situation we have seen uh, uh, this year. In relation to the, the um, point that has been made uh, by Mr Kerr uh, on behalf of the University of Scotland, that is something that I am more than willing to get into in terms of the substance of the detail with the University of Scotland. We have not particularly done that thus far. They have not come forward to me to say how that might specifically manifest itself, uh, I'd be interested to understand in what way it would negatively impact on the educational experience. I've certainly not perceived it to be the case that 
uh, international students coming here to Scotland has negatively impacted in any particular uh, fashion. If it's more an issue around uh, the potential impact for uh, uh, the sector as a consequence of other international events, then I would go back to the answer I've just given uh, to Mr Mara. And that's something we need to take account of in the international education strategy we're committed to taking forward. Scotland are referring. I can't hear you, Mr. Kerr. Sorry. Can you can you hear me? Can you? Thank you. you. Know, yeah. um, I think what University of Scotland are referring to, and this is another quote from their submission to us, is that the funding model that we are now operating to bakes in a structural reliance on international fees. And what they're basically saying is even without the potential of a geopolitical shock, that that is going to erode the quality of the offer that is be because of the cross subsidy, because of the level of the cross subsidy, it's going to erode the quality of the education and the experience on offer in Scotland. That has got to be. Now, I am actually shocked, convener, that that's never been discussed between University of Scotland and the minister, because this seems to me to be a huge existing and known threat. Now, I'll just make one more point, if I might. Hey, and that Kerr. is that the possibilities of further geopolitical shocks are obviously very real, and in particular in relation to the share of international students that come to Scotland from China, which um, is now at 17,165 for 2020, 2021. And of course, we welcome all the international students to Scotland. We're just keeping an eye on the time. My question is that vulnerability of that particular block of students that are, that are creating the cross-subsidy possibility. And does the minister agree that, quote, the Chinese Communist Party is using all the instruments of its international architecture, including the Confucius Institutes, to harass, intimidate and track down people? So two points there. That, by the way, is a quote um, from Stuart Macdonald, thank the you, SNP Mr. Kerr. defence um, spokesman. Can I refer to the minister for his comments and response to that, please? Well, I think the, the first one is a fairly fundamental point that I have to respond to. I'm not suggesting that we haven't discussed these matters, haven't been discussed in the round with the University of Scotland. Of course they have been. Of course they have been. It's about the very specific point that was made in their letter that you've quoted. And I'm, I'm more than willing to pick up on that. In terms of the specific point that uh, Mr Kerr has made around uh, that particular market and that particular cohort of students, I guess that would be reflected in the answer I've already uh, given in terms of how do we work with the sector to be resilient to any particular uh, shock that may come. But let's not let's not talk up the prospect of one in uh, the first instance, but let's make sure that we have a sector that can be resilient to that possibility. And, and on the latter point about Confucius Institutes, I have no direct control or say as to the relationship that any individual institution might have with such organisations. That's for the universities to account for. What I can say is that um, if you look at the Higher Education Act of 2016, we're very clear about what it should be undertaken in terms of academic freedoms in our institutions, and I expect that to be taken uh, very seriously. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, just heading to our final few minutes, I'd like to bring in Stephanie Callaghan, please. Convener, um, a couple of questions rolled into one, Minister. Wellbeing has rightly been a key priority with the Scottish Government funding 80 additional university mental health counsellors. So, firstly, is there adequate support available for students struggling with their mental health? And secondly, we heard the evidence about the positive impact of the additional mental health counsellors and also about the possibility of funding them from budgets, possibly other than education. Are you able to say anything further on that just now or offer an idea on time scales and the decision around continued funding for mental health counsellors? Thanks. So that's, that's something that we're looking at just now, uh, and it's an inextricable part of uh, the budget process. We've made certain commitments through our manifesto and through a programme for government, uh, and I'm very clear we need to meet those uh, commitments in uh, the first instance. Then what we might do beyond that has to be informed by the engagement we have with uh, the sector. And I understand and recognise um, that they see value 
in the investment that's been made in the uh, mental health counsellors. But we also have to be informed by the student mental health uh, action plan that we're going to bring forward in conjunction with the set. We have a student mental health and wellbeing uh, working group, which rightly involves the National Union of Students, uh, other representatives of the, the sector as well, uh, to make sure that we any decisions we take forward on an informed basis and making sure that we are responding to what I recognise are uh, significant challenges in terms of the, the mental well-being of Scotland's student uh, population. It has been an enormously difficult period of time through uh, COVID-19 now in terms of the, the cost of living crisis. That will uh, bring uh, its pressure to bear on the, the student population and their sense of well-being. So our strategy is going to be well-timed uh, in that regard, how we uh, resource that and structure it thereafter is a, a matter of uh, wider consideration in line with the, the ordinary uh, budget process that we have in place. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Minister. Stephanie Callaghan, um, are you uh, finished with your line of questioning? Yes, thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Um, I am mindful of the time. I have allowed um, an extra few minutes to compensate for our technical difficulties, but we are now at the end of this very brief but uh, very productive session. Thank you all for your time this morning. We will now have a brief suspension to allow for the witnesses to log off or leave. Uh, thank you. Item four. Our next item on the agenda is to consider a piece of subordinate legislation, the Education Listed Bodies Scotland Amendment Order 2022. This instrument is subject to the negative procedure. It seeks to modify an earlier order from 2018 to correct the names of two listed bodies within the schedule of that 2018 order. Does anyone have any comments to make on the SSI? No comments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Thank you. Our next item of uh, business today is consideration of a consent notification relating to the European University Institute EU Exit Regulations 2022 EU Exit Legislation. I refer members to paper six in their paper pack. Do members have any comments on the notification? Do, um, are members content with the Scottish Government's decision to consent to the provisions set out in the notifications being included in UK rather than Scottish subordinate legislation? Thank you. The public part of today's meeting is now at an end. Uh, we will now consider our final agenda items in private. And as my first sort of uh, subbing for the convener, um, I would like to thank everybody for their help and support this morning. And I would like to wish uh, Pam Gosel, who uh, attended as well, uh, the best for the rest of her day as well. So thank you to everyone and goodbye.